All right then, uh, that should be good. Uh, sorry about that. The music was my. Well, how about now, Thomas? Is the uh, is the sound better now, or I think I had to uh, refresh, and at the same time refresh the uh, the recording device. Okay. Uh, well, tonight, Lord Willing, we'll continue the series on the Ten Horns. And we began to look at some of these verses the last time. Five of Fallen. The verse we read, uh, that's Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And the reason I'd like to look at these verses again, uh, you know, we mentioned the last time that we want to talk about, yeah, the Ten Horns continued. We want to talk uh, about how the number 7 or the number 10, that we're not really to put, as far as I can see, to place much emphasis on the, uh, the number itself, but rather the context in which the number is found. Because the number 7, I think it's not just, even though God is talking about the beast or the kingdom of Satan or the dominion, right, the unsaved uh, body, including wheat and tares prior to the separation. Uh, we really have to analyze the context to see whether or not we can pick up the gospel. What I proposed the last time is that it appears from everything that I can see so far that the five that are fallen, we read about there are seven kings, seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, verse 10, five are fallen, one is and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, who are the five that are fallen? What does it mean that five are fallen? How do we understand that in light of some of the other things that we're learning regarding what happens to the church in tribulation? What I offer there is that the seven kings is really looking at the entire kingdom. You know, we tend to, uh, to analyze these verses and then we're thinking of uh, seven kings. And in the context, God is talking about uh, seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So we're not really, uh, at least that's the way that I used to look at these verses, not really separating them or we're not trying to relate to the whole kingdom. But I think uh, the mind perhaps is conditioned to look at just the unsaved body. And that's what uh, we'll try to relate to tonight. Uh, and how it's not just including the unsaved body, but rather the whole kingdom prior to the separation of wheat and tares. So, seven kings, five are fallen. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 33. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. And I think what we're going to see is that, you see, in tribulation, the whole body falls. That's not surprising. God's wrath is on the whole body. God is looking at the entire body as unclean, right? That's why the believers, for them, it's chastisement. They are tried in a fire. And then when Christ is actually revealed, now God brings judgment to the rest of the body. Now the... Uh, there is a complete separation and the unsaved they fall eternally never to rise again so we see that they shall fall by the sword by flame by captivity uh, but when they come out of tribulation they do instruct because they receive the word to speak Daniel 11:35. some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and the purge and to make them white. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way, though he fall. Now, why would God speak of the elect as fallen? Why do you suppose this is so? Though he fall, what does it mean? Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. And you know what I've offered in the past is that, yeah, the, the believers, they fall in tribulation because they don't have the word to speak, right? They're not receiving uh, 
understanding until the revelation of Christ. So they too, they are subject to the false doctrines, the false gospels. Not that they lost their salvation, right? They didn't lose their salvation. But in terms of because God brings them out of tribulation, they are not destroyed. They do not come into the second death. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. Well, the believers are not the enemy of Christ. They've been redeemed. But they are said to be enemies to the unsaved and vice versa. Right? Can you relate to that? Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. Let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. When do the believers stumble and fall? Again, I think ultimately in, in tribulation. Micah 7 verse 8, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And we know, you know, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 11 verse 10, When they, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, at the killing of the two witnesses. So you see, the unsaved, the wicked in the body, they did not obey this command. That's a command, right? If it's in the Bible, it's the word of God. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. So we read here, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. So they disobey that command, which is another reason why God's wrath would come on them. John 16, verse 20. Ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Who is the world? That's in view here. Who is the world? One reason again why we have to... We, uh, uh, we do have sound here. Can anyone hear me? I know Eric said that the sound was good. Bismar, hi. Can you hear me? Do you have sound? Thomas may need to refresh. unsaved body yeah exactly uh, Bismore um, yeah we're looking at the church the corporate body and so they rejoice at the killing of the two witnesses ye shall weep and lament the world shall rejoice ye shall be sorrowful but your sorrow shall be turned into joy when does that happen well again at the revelation of Christ right Psalm 38, verse 16. Uh, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me when my foot slippeth. Same idea, I believe. Those who fall in tribulation. God abandons the whole body, the whole church. So the kingdom falls at the wrath of God. And the unsaved, they rejoice at the killing of the two witnesses. For a time, for a season. Uh, Obadiah chapter 1 verse 12. How about now, Thomas? Can you hear me? Obadiah chapter 1 verse 12. But thou, okay, good, shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Uh, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Interesting how God is speaking of their destruction so again uh, I propose that the believers the elect they're a part of the body prior to the separation so the whole body is destroyed it falls right in tribulation lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against them and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved Psalm 35 verse 15 in mine adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves uh, together against me. Okay, so that was Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And I think here in the following verse, let me see if I can get that to post. Nope. I got to break it up. I've got a few colors here. Now in verse 11, and the beast that was, let me, uh, let me post the rest of the verse, and then I want to look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 10 again. So see, uh, you know, to try and pick up the thread. 
In Revelation chapter 17, verse 10, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And then in the very next verse we read, And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh. Now I think, you know, before I used to look at this verse, I really couldn't make out uh, what God was saying here. But I think by God's grace, I understand why he would actually uh, phrase the verse. Now, the number eight is not mentioned, as you know, we talked about before. God started off speaking of seven kings. So why introduce the number eight here? Can you see that? Why would God say, he is the eighth? And I think, Lord willing, it's a clue to show that this has to do with the redemption of the body. So that's the beast that had received a, a sword and tribulation. And it does include the elect. It does include the believers. Believe it or not, right? From everything that I can see. We read here again another verse that I think would confirm that. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Right, exactly, Thomas. They are the same. And if uh, the number seven here is really looking at, is looking at the church body in tribulation, the number eight is looking at the redemption, the salvation, the fact that the body has been redeemed. So it's still the, you know, it's still the same kingdom. It's the same beast. But now God begins to show the separation. The number eight, I think, is looking at the salvation of the body, the redemption. Just as we see here in Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads. You know, the head has to do with whom? Who was the head of the body? It is Christ, right? And I think we're going to see also in the next section, when we look at those that are plucked up by the roots, how there would seem to be a, a tie in there as well. So can you see that? Revelation 17, verse 10, God speaks of seven kings, five are fallen. Yeah. Seven kings, five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And the other that is to come, I think it relates to uh, Satan going into perdition after Christ is revealed. All the world wandered after the beast. Same language here in Revelation 13, verse 3. So one of the head was wounded in tribulation. Now the deadly wound was healed. So he is the eighth. He is the one. That is, that's the body that had received a death blow in tribulation. And now God, is, uh, God has made provision. He has redeemed the body. And yet he speaks of it as being of the seven. Can you see that? Now again, the reason I wanted to look at this is because this, I think, would seem to support the fact that the number seven is not just looking at the unsaved body. And if that's the case, well then, even the ten horns appears uh, to be looking at the church body, the entire kingdom. And that's why perhaps it's not surprising to see some verses that speak to salvation and other verses that would seem to speak to judgment. Very beautiful uh, parallel there, I think, Lord Willing. Okay, let's see if we can uh, follow it up some more. The horns that are plucked up by the roots. And I believe here it is the, uh, the elect again falling before little horn. Now we read about little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. I consider the horns, that's the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now, tell me, what is this uh, talking about? Who are the uh, the horns that are in view? Three horns were plucked up by the roots. I think we've talked about this uh before in the past, but I think it's uh, it's bear uh, it bears repeating, right? These are not easy verses, but Lord willing, again, if we uh, try to 
pick up the gospel, then hopefully these verses might make sense. Three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Who is the root in the Bible? Remember, like I mentioned just now, Revelation 13, verse 3, one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. The head would have to be Christ. He is the head of the body. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Yeah. <clears throat> so what I believe is in view here is, again, the saying that uh, looking at the five kings that are fallen, seven kings, five are fallen in tribulation. The body is plucked up by the roots. And it's really because of the false apostles, the wicked in the church, the locusts. God allows them to go free. Uh, the believers are there. They've not yet received the kingdom. The book is sealed prior to the revelation of Christ. Second Chronicles 7, verse 20. Then will I pluck them up by the roots. Now is God here just talking about the wicked? I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight. Well, that's interesting language. Doesn't God speak of hiding his face from the body, from the whole house of Israel? Now, who can tell me now when we read this language that somehow God would only be speaking of the wicked in the body? You know, when the children of Israel went to Babylon, everyone had to go into captivity. That's where they are delivered. They're, they're delivered from captivity. But prior to that, it's God's wrath, it's God's judgment that allowed the wicked king, Nebuchadnezzar, to come against the people of God, right? Taking the spoil, destroying the city, taking the goodly vessels, and then taking everyone to Babylon. So they fall. And that was a picture of the church, the elect, being a part of the body at a time when God forsakes the body. You see that? Uh, 2 Kings 17, verse 20, The Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, cast them out of his sight. Job 24, verse 9, They plucked the fatherless from the breast. What's the timing of this, ultimately? What comes to mind when we see the word breast? They pluck the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge of the poor. Can you see how, again, this would seem to relate? This is a language of tribulation. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 17. If they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation. Now, did the believers obey God in tribulation? Were they keeping the word of God, the commandments of God? Something to think about, right? One might say, well, yeah, I mean, they, they've been redeemed, they're saved, so of course they're keeping, yeah, they're keeping the commandment in Christ. <laughs> Thomas says they were confused. I know I was, Thomas, and today, again, it's only by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, that these verses are now unsealed. We can find comfort, assurance, that this is Christ being revealed. Amazing, right? Uh, but very, uh, very relevant, or uh, and I do think it relates to what happened at the start of the Great Tribulation. Yeah, they were confused. So they were not obeying the commandments. Now take a look at Jeremiah chapter 45. Oops. Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 4. We read thus... Shall thou say unto him, The Lord said, Behold, that which I have built will I break down. What is it that God built? What did God build? That which I have built will I break down, 
and that which I have planted I will pluck up even this whole land Jeremiah 31 verse 28 and it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down Well, the context here, again, would seem to indicate that God is looking at the whole kingdom. Because if he breaks down the kingdom and then he rebuilds it, so it's the whole body, right, that experienced tribulation. That which I have planted, I will pluck up even this whole land. Uh, verse 28, And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down, and to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict. Job was afflicted in tribulation. So will I watch over them to build and to plan salvation, redemption, right? So they're first uh, scattered in tribulation, and then God now is, uh, he is jealous for his land, and then he begins to gather them. Ecclesiastes 3, 2, a time to be born, time to die, time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. Psalm 52, verse 5, God will likewise destroy, destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out. Bismarck writes, uh, Jeremiah 1, 17, uh, let's see. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 17 Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee be not dismayed at their faces lest I confound thee before them Yeah, that, that's an interesting verse uh, and I think it does relate Arise and speak unto them all that I command thee be not dismayed at their faces lest I confound thee before them and I think we can see that, you know, looking at the rest of the Bible, uh, the nature of the Great Tribulation is that God is judging the whole body. Uh, 110, that's what I read. Oh, I'm sorry, did I? I posted 17. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, 110, see I have this day. Thank you. Is that the one? I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build and to plant. Yeah, amen. So God roots out, right? He roots up the, uh, the body. And the root, again, is Christ. It is simply the fact that Christ is not there, right? God begins to remove uh, the Holy Spirit in tribulation. So it is plucked up by the roots. The kings fall. It is plucked up by the roots. And God now, he is, uh, when Christ is actually revealed, now uh, there is another uh, judgment, destruction. God again, he speaks of plucking up by the roots. But this time, it is focusing on uh, the period when Satan goes into perdition. George, hi, welcome. Jude chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, feast of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about of winds trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots so can you see the language of plucking up being plucked up by the roots it is tribulation and judgment God plants and he breaks down. And that's the healing of the body. One of his heads as it were wounded to death. And the deadly wound was healed. Any questions on this section? To be plucked up by the roots. Language of tribulation. Now here's some more verses. Uh, looking at the elect. When they fall before the enemy. And who is the enemy? Yeah, trees, I believe, uh, that too is pointing to the church, uh, those in the body, Thomas. Uh, yeah, trees whose fruit, with, yeah, the fruit withereth. In other words, uh, there's no blessing there, like the fig tree. 
shaken, it, it's not uh, bearing any fruit. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Uh, Leviticus 26, verse 37. They shall fall upon one another as it were before a sword, when none pursueth. And ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. Now, remember in the Old Testament, what happened when God was upset with the nation of Israel? And they went to fight, uh, say like the Philistines, uh, some of the heathen nations. What happened? Anyone remember? If somehow perhaps there was a sin, they committed, uh, they trespassed against God, and now they are going to battle. What did God do a number of times in the past? <laughs> they got beat up. Yeah, Thomas, exactly. They fled from before the enemy. They were destroyed, and then they would begin to, to lament uh, how is it possible that God would allow us to fall at the hand of the enemy? Remember that? Yeah, God allows them to be destroyed. Um, and it's the same thing. I think that that was a picture of what happens in tribulation. Because of the wickedness of the entire body, God forsakes the body. And so they fall at the hand of the enemy. But God does not leave them there because he prophesied again and again that he would bring back their captivity. And somehow, even in the book of Judges, we see that every time that they would fall, God allows them to be destroyed, and then he raises a judge. And you know, uh, now that I think of it, uh, that's a beautiful picture of salvation, I believe. Raising up a judge, even after they were destroyed, after they sinned, yeah. Okay, so they fall before the enemy. God have power to help and to cast down. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 7. I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies. Verse Samuel 18, verse 25. I think that's an interesting statement. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. The king desireth any dowry, dowry uh, but a hundred foreskin of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. So uh, we'd have to look at the context there, but I, I do believe uh, from what I was able to pick up there, it would be uh, a similar picture. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 38. I think this also relates. And the king, that's David, said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man. He's talking about Abner. A great man fallen this day in Israel. And Abner was Saul's cousin. Uh, and he was slain by Joab. So there, I believe, again, is a picture of the body, the elect. In tribulation, they're destroyed. They fall before the the enemy. Hosea chapter 7, verse 7. They're hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. Remember, seven kings, five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. Are the believers kings? Or better yet, are the unsaved in the church, are they kings? Can we look at them as kings and priests? Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole body, right? I am the head. Christ is the head of the body. I am the vine, ye are the branches. So Christ is a king. So even if we're looking at the unsaved, I think it's safe to say, Lord willing, that they too, they are kings. So not surprising that seven kings is looking at the church, corporate body, prior to the separation. Yeah, good kings, bad kings. Well, actually, all the kings were bad, if you, if you think about it, uh, coming into the Great Tribulation. I think that's what's in view there. Seven kings, five are fallen. Uh, but yeah, they, the good kings identify with Christ. 
But it is an evidence, we begin to see the evidence of that when? At the revelation of Christ, right? Christ is revealed. Okay, uh, Jeremiah chapter 39, I'm sorry, uh, 38 verse 19. But yeah, Thomas, I do agree. Uh, good kings and bad kings. Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans. The Jews fall to the Chaldeans. What's another name for Chaldea or the Chaldeans? Anyone? Yeah, the Babylonians. I agree. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself, to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies. They fall by the sword of the enemy. And thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah... See, again, God there did not stop and say, well, let me separate the believers. There had to have been believers, wouldn't you say? There had to have been believers in the land of Judah at the time when God allowed them to be taken captive. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. But even there, God does not seem to be uh, separating. He is not saying, okay, well, let me just separate... You know, I don't think it's fair because these, uh, you know, they identify with Christ. And why should they go into captivity? Why, th why should they be subject to the king of Babylon? But we don't read that though, do we? Everyone had to obey. Now I know in the context God speaks of uh, leaving some of the poor of the land to be vine dressers. And there again, I think that's a picture, Lord willing, uh, Lord willing within a picture. And that too would seem to relate to salvation. Those that are left. And he shall carry them captive into Babylon. They fall to the Chaldeans. Proverbs 7 verse 25. Let not thine heart decline her ways. Yeah, thank you Bismar. Uh, Daniel too, he was taken to Babylon. So, and, and by the way, that's a command, I believe. You know, the body, everyone had to obey. They had to bring their necks uh, under the yoke of the king of Babylon. If they didn't, then they would, show, they would be shown to be in rebellion against God, right? And now because they go to Babylon, God redeems them at the appointed time. Christ is revealed, and now God begins the separation. Now they're allowed to go back to the homeland to rebuild salvation come out of for my people let not thine heart decline to her ways go not astray in her paths for she hath cast down many wounded who is that she hath cast down many wounded yea many strong men have been slain by her five are fallen the body fell to the enemy in tribulation uh, and also a couple of side verses, uh, I think also relate, perhaps indirectly, Luke chapter 11, 17. Uh, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. A house divided against itself, against the house, falleth. And I propose that the kingdom is divided in tribulation. It becomes two. And then God brings the two sticks together. At the revelation of Christ, it becomes one kingdom. Right, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Um, okay, so that that's some other verses, Lord willing, for consideration. And then finally, we we'll to look at uh, just a few verses on the uh, the judgment side. When Christ is revealed, the unsaved body. Now God speaks of it as falling. Uh, and then he also uses the elect. He uses the elect as well as the wicked in the body to destroy the unsaved. And five of you shall chase a hundred, a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, 
and your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. Psalm 18 verse 38. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. Now who are the ones that are not rising? God wounds the whole body in tribulation. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So the whole body is wounded in tribulation, right? But here, the fact that they are not able to rise... Well, that would seem to relate to the wicked. They do not, or well, they rise. God speaks of the hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. They rise spiritually to stand for judgment. Yeah, exactly, Abysmore Babylon. They stand for judgment, but God does not give them ears to hear. And so from that vantage point, they would, uh, God speaks of them as not rising. They're not being redeemed. They're not rising to life. Instead, they rise to judgment. They rise so that they can be put to death again. Uh, and that there might be the reason why God speaks of double destruction. It's either that or the fact that God is using both the wicked as well as the, the elect to destroy the body. Somewhere along the line, that might be the case, Lord willing. Uh, Psalm 20, verse 8, They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen. The believers, they rise. They come out of Babylon. God redeems them, which is what I believe is going on today. Okay, and finally, Ezekiel 38, verse 20. Uh, we read about the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, creeping things. And when God brings judgment to them, right, to the church, the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. So Babylon has fallen, has fallen, come out of her, my people. But before, prior to the fall of Babylon, who was it that fell? The wicked reign, uh, they, they rise in tribulation, they put to death the elect, and then when Christ rises, when the body rises, God destroys the wicked. Okay. All right. A very quick conclusion. And then we can uh, open for discussion. The Bible appears to be equating the five kings that are fallen, Revelation 17, verse 10, to the elect body falling to the enemy in tribulation. They too are said to be kings prior to the separation. And God seemed to be looking at the number seven. By the way, I didn't mention that before. What is the number seven spiritually would be uh, pointing to in this context? Seven kings, five are fallen. God speaks of seven mountains. The number seven, I mentioned before, I think it relates, it ties into the Great Tribulation. And it has to do with judgment, depending on the context. The same thing with the number five. The fact that five are fallen, it is in the language of judgment beginning at the house of God. The same as we read also in uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, three of the first ones plucked up by the roots. The number three, there too, I think, depending on the context, we can see the gospel. So that would have been judgment, again, on the church, on the body, the elect, as they were afflicted in tribulation. So seven mountains, seven kings, as the entire kingdom in tribulation. When Christ is revealed at the end of the tribulation, the wicked who had opposed Satan, exalting his throne above the stars of God, those who oppose the kingdom, they oppose the body, now they are said to fall at the revelation of Christ. All right, any questions? That's all I have uh, for this topic here. Uh, hold on one second.